I had this question, I'm sure many of you do, well, what exactly is Waldorf math? And in the process of doing that, I'll also investigate the question of what is math in general. And I, and I guess I first have to admit here that uh, I, I'd say it's quite a blessing in, in, a, in a place, in a school system that we rely so much on the insights and wisdom of one individual, Rudolf Steiner. Uh, in, a, in, in many ways, actually, it's a blessing that he didn't tell us too much. Uh, so we really, as teachers, have to figure out quite a bit for ourselves. And so I just want to just be clear here that as I say, you know, here's what I'm doing, and I know sometimes it gets confusing. Uh, so it's not necessarily that everything I do is what is Waldorf math, is what is done in every Waldorf school in the world. Uh, in some cases, there's, there are some things in common. In some cases, it can actually be quite different. The education system, I think, in, in this society today, in our culture today, is, I think, really in um, a bad state right now. And so this is something that I think a lot of us are focusing on, certainly in this country, is how can we make things better? Uh, and yet, and I want to acknowledge that there are many people out there trying to re-envision what education could be, and of all the ideas out there, many of them are actually very good. Uh, yes, even outside of Waldorf education. And many of the ideas out there are a bit frightening as well. We seem to be going more in a direction all the time of more standardized testing, and at the same time, younger and younger age. And, and we even get pressures of this in Waldorf schools. Uh, I think we have the luxury here, I know, being at Shining Mountain, uh, the fact that we go all the way to 12th grade. <clears throat> that's a very, it's a blessing, because I, I work with many schools and have consulted at many schools where they stop at 8th grade, and then there's even more pressure. Oh, they're going into high school right now. They have to be ready for exactly what that is. We do have some students that will leave after 8th grade. Uh, for whatever reason, or they may move and go to another, you know, move out of state or something. And they always do fine anyway, really. They go off to other high schools and they're absolutely fine. Um, <clears throat> but I think that trend here that what we see is, again, more and more material at a young age, more testing, and actually less depth is what really ends up happening as a result of much of that. Uh, I want to read a quote um, regarding some of the things I'm talking about right now. It is not enough to teach a man a specialty. It is essential that the student acquire an understanding and a lively feeling for values. He must acquire a vivid sense of the beautiful and of the morally good. Otherwise, he, with his specialized knowledge, more closely resembles a well-trained dog than a harmoniously developed person. Overemphasis on the competitive system and premature specialization kill the spirit on which all cultural life depends. It is vital that independent critical thinking be developed in the young human being. Overburdening students with too much material leads to superficiality. Any guesses on who would have written that? <clears throat> when it was written? Yeah, you'd almost think it would be Rudolf Steiner, somebody, or maybe even somebody quite, it could be quite contemporary, couldn't it? Uh, it was actually, this is from an editorial written by uh, Albert Einstein in the New York Times in 1952. Uh, I found that was quite interesting. Um, now, when he talks about it is vital that independent critical thinking be developed in the young human being, um, I, I'm not sure how young he was talking about. Maybe that's where we would differ from what he was thinking. I'm not sure. But um, certainly that is a goal, and I'm, I'm speaking as a high school teacher here, that that's certainly one very important aspect of high school education is to develop this critical thinking. Of course, you may also know the quote from Albert Einstein, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. It's a favorite one of mine. What is it that makes so many students feel that they are bad at math? Just quick replies from anyone. You can just popcorn, say something. So not feeling the emotional connection to math. Not seeing the usefulness of math. Society's preconceived notions. I'm repeating a lot of things. So right brain learners not connecting to numbers. So very task-driven mathematics and, I don't know, traumatized by grades or anxiety about grades. Yeah, absolutely. No context. I would, I would go further and say... Um, that it, it wasn't human. And it's, it ties into a couple of the other things here. It's just so completely removed from anything. It's, it's what does it have to do with me? What does it have to do with the history of human consciousness? What does it have to, how, what was its role in the development of, 
of civilization. A lot of times that isn't connected, absolutely. Um, time for a math joke. So this is, this is my spin on a math joke uh, having to do with the next question. There are three types of people in the world, those who know what math is and those who don't. Um, but at any rate, um, <laughs> so next question is, next question is, um, what do you think math is? Does that seem like a silly question? Because I'll have to admit, it was the first day of my teacher training, so I was very new to Waldorf. The first day, that was what my mentor gave to me as a question, what is math? And at that time, I thought it was kind of a silly question. I'd never, isn't that weird? I'd never really thought about it. Uh, and now mm. I think about it a lot. And, and I really am not sure what it is, actually. But um, <laughs> That probably seems very frightening, right? So everybody suddenly you know, runs out of the room. I don't know. But um, anyway, tell me what you think. Yeah. Universal language. Universal language. OK, we can characterize it, by the way. This is good. This is what we do in Waldorf schools, right? Don't give the definition. Let's characterize it, build up an understanding. Very good, yeah. I think it's the higher level, just one aspect of it is man's um, attempt to define and understand um, the, the world that is around them by breaking it down into uh, elements or uh, bits of knowledge that they can understand. Okay, humanity's attempt to understand the world yeah, through, lang through the language that we spoke about earlier, yes. Through math we can translate nature into a language we can understand, yes. Very good. Other ideas? A language of nature, but also a tool of discovery. Okay, a tool of discovery. Quantitative versus qualitative language, all right? This notion, it's beautiful, it's abstract, it can be engrossing, and uh, it's sort of, if it helps describe the world, that's good too, but that's for like physicists and chemists and yeah. stuff. I mean, that brings up this whole notion of, well, what are, where are we talking about math? Where are we talking about science? Yeah, we've been actually, this, this is a question we've been uh, addressing very much in my 12th grade philosophy of math course. Um, to give you a little bit of sense of what we're doing here in the high school, their uh, normal, what would you say, uh, skills, math education ends halfway through 12th grade. We finished with calculus uh, where we were going to take that uh, a couple weeks ago, and now we have the whole class together in the third quarter to do philosophy of math, and so we're discussing this. And one of the articles we read was um, by a famous mathematician, and I think it was written about 70 years ago, named G.H. Hardy, out of his work called Mathematician's Apology. Um, very interesting work. And, and he really um, talks about this whole idea. <clears throat> he says, math, there are more people interested in math than almost anything, including music. And so you see that and you think, wait a minute, what is he talking about, you know, even in that day and age, let alone today? And yet his point is that, for instance, the game we started with at the beginning, this NIM game with the toothpicks, and I just gave those of you who were here a little bit earlier on time, uh, that those toothpicks, that toothpick game is very engrossing. You can really get into it, and as you play it more, and it's a wonderful thing for people of all ages, actually, to do. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been interested in Sudoku. Um, anything like that. I mean, if you really look at all these different things that are math perhaps disguised and you weren't thinking of it in, as math, there's a great amount of interest in these sort of things, of using our mind in these mathematical kind of ways, even though we may not think of it actually as math. I want to focus on this idea of solving problems, because if I really think about, and I think if we all do this, if we think about somebody we knew in school, who was really good at math, you know, a friend or somebody else that maybe, I don't know, that, that you knew who was good at math, I would venture to say that what makes us say that is because they did well in their math classes. And usually doing well in your math classes mean you, means that you became very good at solving problems, solving math problems. You know, you came to it, you sat down at a table at a given point, and there was a test, and you were given a bunch of math problems to solve, and you were able to do that. And I think that really, I think, summarizes largely what math has become. Now, if you think, if you really think about that, what was the skill needed in order to do that? Let's even backtrack all the way back to something like sixth grade. 
And I'm not saying it should be otherwise. I'm just saying this is the way it is. You sit down, here's the math test, and you recognize, you recognize, look, this is a division problem. Well, what do I do with a division problem? For instance, if it looks something like this, then you immediately recognize, oh, I know how to do this. I am going to put this inside the box. Now, this is in this country. Of course, if you grew up outside of this country, very possibly you would have done it differently. And so you immediately have a procedure. I look at this, and I ask myself, how many times does it go into there? Oh, once. So I then multiply this by this. And I have this whole procedure whereby and even this, I probably cheated a little bit um, because here many people would say, wait, wait, no, you can't do that. You have to borrow and do this, right? It's one of my favorite ones. I always love this one is uh, sometimes you'll see a student do this. Um, you ever seen this? This is really great. Okay, oh, I can't do this. I have to borrow. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I wish I was joking. Um, <laughs> and so what I'm pointing out here is that all along people's math education, what math really was, it was recognizing problems and, and knowing what procedure to attach to the problems in order to get the right answer. And if you follow the correct steps, I'm not done with this one yet, but if I followed it to completion, I could then circle my answer and know that I'm done. And oftentimes it becomes so rigid that, yes, this has to be a small one here. No, we can't cross that out this way. It has to be this way. Yes, we have to write the zero up to the side. And kids can become quite stuck on this. So what I'm defining here of what math has become for our society is this list of blind procedures to attach to math problems. It's a list of blind procedures to attach to problems. And I don't want to make it sound like, well, that should never happen, because that's not true. I mean, long division, although I feel actually it's probably way overrated, Sure, students should experience long division. And I will say, on the other hand, with long division, I have known many students who have come into sixth grade, seventh grade. They finished seventh grade, somehow survived, never got a long division problem right, ever. And they went on to high school, and they actually became good math students. They were especially very happy when they were given a calculator in eighth grade. <laughs> so they never had to do it again. And I'd venture to guess that there, and not to embarrass anybody here, there are probably several people here who don't remember any long division have done fine in life, <laughs> right? I even remember as a math geek going and actually teaching for the first time after being in engineering school and all of that and suddenly realizing I don't remember how to do long division anymore. And it didn't matter. It really didn't until I had to teach it when I finally came to become a teacher in lower grades. So there is a time when procedures are very important in math, but my major point here is I think it's been neglected. I think in this race, in building into this theme of the race to know there, in this race to get ahead, we don't have time to actually discover what's behind a lot of these procedures. Long division is a procedure. It doesn't have to be a blind procedure. And I'm not even saying it shouldn't be. I'm just saying it doesn't have to be. Behind every procedure, there is, I hope, some really good math to be discovered. Let me give an example. 